It's Magic Time, the podcast dedicated to helping you create magic in your everyday life. And now your hosts, author and creativity coach Ryan Hall and Reiki healer and holistic life coach Emily Perkins. Welcome to Magic Time, the podcast of possibility, the podcast of connection, and the podcast of magic. I am Ryan Hall. I am a novelist contributor to the Goodman Project and Life Coach for Kings. Emily, not this again. Come on. Speak. Oh, crap. She's not even here. (laughs) Welcome back to the program. And you may probably notice that we have been in a bit of a hiatus for a little while. And just full disclosure, Emily and I, both of our schedules have just gotten nuts. I've just gotten absolutely crazy, and we haven't been able to really get together. We haven't been able to get together to record any episodes, so she did give me her blessing to go ahead and record this episode solo, and I am excited and honored to do so, and something that when Emily does come back to the program, all I'm going to say is... I, you know, I had a, had a phone conversation with her the other day when she gave me this blessing, and you guys are going to be asking for our autograph very soon. She's about to blow up like real big. So it is, uh, you know, it's really a truly a privilege to still be partnering, uh, partnering with her on this. She ain't going anywhere. She's not going anywhere. Magic Time will continue with Emily Perkins and Ryan Hall, but for this week, it is me. And I've got a topic I wanted to talk about here today that has really been on my mind pretty hardcore, to be honest with you. Really been on my mind pretty hardcore for the past, uh, really for the past year. But it's really been front and center in my space for the past, like, two weeks or so. And today I wanted to talk about the magic of authenticity. Now, what I mean by being authentic, I'm really talking about just really speaking from the heart. I'm really talking about sharing yourself from the heart because so many people speak, but not enough people share. Not enough people share about who they are, about what they're all about in the world, how they're showing up in the world, what's important to them. And they just keep that They just keep that stuff under wraps. They just keep that stuff behind closed doors. They keep it... They keep it behind bars. And it really... If if you think about it, it really becomes like a... really becomes like a... Like a prison, in a way. It really becomes like a prison because you're a prisoner of your own performance. You're a prisoner of just your own your own story it's as i said it's something that has been in my space pretty hardcore for the past really for the past year about many things in my life and when i do mean many things i mean many things because it's like i've got this like my biggest fear about really showing myself, really sharing myself with the people I love, really showing up vulnerable and honest and authentic with the people who I love, is that I just won't be accepted. I won't be accepted. I won't be appreciated. And if I ever do, like, truly, like, come forward and just like really show up raw and vulnerable and honest then the people in my life who i who i might show up like that as like actually show up as raw and vulnerable and honest and authentic that they're gonna run they're absolutely going to run i have had experience with this though i have had experience with this and to be honest, it's broken my heart many, many times. It's broken my heart more than I really care to admit. And it's, it's kept me from really 
laying my heart on the line and just sharing myself vulnerably and honestly and completely with people. And it really breaks my heart. It really breaks my heart because the world really deserves to know. The world really deserves to see. The world really deserves to really appreciate my truth. Because my truth is beautiful. And so is yours. That's all I'm going to say about that. But I have been... This has been really in my space, like pretty hardcore for the past week. For reasons that I will definitely get into here in this, in this next share. How many of y'all are familiar with the the exercise and survival mechanism known as Tommy Wiseau. Tommy Wiseau is, he's an enigma. He's an enigma wrapped in a riddle and deep fried in a vat of boiling quandary. Nobody really knows how old he is. But before I really get into that, Tommy Wiseau wrote, directed, produced, financed, and starred in what is really regarded as the one of the worst movies ever made. <coughs> he wrote, directed, starred, and produced The Room. Now, if you have not seen The Room, you haven't, well, to be honest, you haven't seen Shakespeare the way it was meant to be seen. If Shakespeare was written by a weird vampire alien man with, without basic knowledge of storytelling, without basic knowledge of human interaction, and without basic knowledge of just how the world works. It's one of the worst movies I've ever seen, but it's also one of the coolest experiences I've ever had because this movie is so good, it's, it's so bad, it's brilliant. Long story short, the story, it's a, it's a basic love triangle between uh, Tommy's character named Johnny. Johnny is a, he's a banker, he is a... Uh, who the hell knows where he's from? He's got this unintelligible accent and speaks in such a stilted way. And to be honest, I think he speaks the way... Well, he, I know he speaks the way that Tommy uh, that uh, Tommy Wiseau speaks. But he's... He's got the depth of character like a sheet of paper. I mean, you can see right through this guy. And he is engaged to his future wife. Nobody uses the word fiancé in this movie. But his future wife is a... I think the word sociopath really comes to mind. But her name is Lisa. And Lisa is carrying on an affair with Tommy's best friend. A man by the name of Mark. The story makes no sense. It has subplots that get brought up and dismissed and it, it, this the movie itself is a total train wreck but like i said the experience is sublime i bring this up oh, uh, uh, by the way i just a just a few weeks ago here in port chester i saw a guy if you've never seen tommy wiseau the guy is eccentric let's see he always wears at least two belts i think at least two probably at least three but i'm not sure he dresses very strangely almost vampirish 
He has long, stringy black hair, which is obviously dyed with either shoe polish or, or sharpie. He's got really strange features, and he's got an accent that sounds Eastern European, but he claims he was from New Orleans. Trust me, I've heard people from New Orleans, and they sure as hell don't sound like this guy. But I saw a guy here in Port Chester that really looked a lot like him. And I was really tempted to lean out the window of my car and ask him how his sex life was. It's a call back to the movie. Anyway. I'm really reminded of all this because of a film that I saw just last weekend. And the film was called The Disaster Artist. Now, The Disaster Artist is really a behind-the-scenes look of the making of the room, but also the inside baseball, the relationship that, that Wiseau has with his co-star, the one who plays Mark, an actor by the name of Greg Sestero. And it's based off of his book, Sestero's book. This movie had me in tears several times. Mostly it was because of laughing. But there is there is one aspect of that of that movie that completely completely and totally shattered my heart. I was a bawling mess. If James Franco does not get an Oscar nomination for this movie, it is a damn crying shame. He was brilliant. The scene that I'm talking about, I don't think this was something that actually happened. It was sort of a dr dramatization of an event that actually happened. Or I think the filmmakers took some creative liberties, let's say. Because I'm in, currently in process of reading Sestero's book. Tommy and Greg live in Tommy's apartment in Los Angeles. One bedroom apartment. Tommy has some kind of weird curtain thing going on in his living room. And it's obvious to me that Tommy has a just a crippling fear of being found out. He has a crippling fear that people are going to discover him for a fraud because more than likely he is a fraud. More than likely he is a fraud because nobody knows how old this guy is. Nobody knows what country he's from. And nobody knows how he got the how he got the money. The 6 million plus dollars. Nobody knows how he got the money to put the room together to actually create this film, to actually create this train wreck. But it's obvious to me that the guy has a crippling fear of being lonely. Something I wish I didn't relate to as deeply as I do. I had no idea I would relate to this as deeply as I do. Because something happened during the film when, um, when uh, Greg meets a woman, they fall in love and choose to move in together. Tommy, and, and this is during a production of the movie. Tommy gets so bent out of shape about this, he just goes into a... He, he has a temper tantrum, to be honest. He has a temper tantrum. This was a heartbroken man. And again, I wish I didn't relate to it as deeply as I do. Because I've seen numerous examples, just numerous examples of this in my own life. Because Tommy saw this as a personal rejection of him. 
when in reality he was just choosing to go a different path. I've had this happen to me before. Like there was a there was a woman from my past. The woman from my past who will remain nameless. All I'm going to say is her her name begins with the first letter of the English alphabet. And her name rhymes with Cromanda, but I, I'm getting ahead of myself. Amanda and I had been seeing each other for a little while. And it was obvious that I was seeing the relationship far differently than she was. Because she started seeing this, this much older guy. She's right, right at my age. She's like a couple months like older than I am. I mean, we're like very close in age. And she started seeing this guy, much older guy, in Nashville. This guy was a songwriter, was nominated for a Grammy that year, I believe. Had written a song for a pretty big star that got nominated for a Grammy. I'm not going to name the uh, particular artist. Because I really don't want to embarrass her because this is not her fault. And I've, I've done a lot of completion work around this. I'm just, I'm just saying. It's taken a lot of work for me to forgive her for this. But, of course, in reality, when you hold something over somebody, you're you're usually holding it over yourself. That's how shame works. It's just anger directed inward. But when Amanda started seeing... Damn it, I said her name. But when she started seeing this guy, I got really... I got really angry. I got really angry and resentful, and I hated her for it. Because I expected her to, like, see through my feelings. But as soon as she had started seeing this guy, I immediately took it personally. What did he have that I didn't have? Was he... Was he rich? I mean, he probably had more money than I did. He was nominated for a Grammy. Was he rich? Was he better looking? Was he taller? I don't know. And I remember when I found out about this, I was still at work. I remember when I found out about this, I logged out of the phone. I went to the men's room. And I think I screamed, cried for 20 minutes. My supervisors probably had no idea where the hell I was. And that's, and just now is like the first time I've ever mentioned this publicly to anybody. And I'm putting it out on iTunes. What? I was hurt. I was really hurt. And I, and I was really, I was really touched and moved. And to be honest, I was really upset when I saw the sequence in the Disaster Artist. Because that, that's not the first time that has happened uh, to me. And usually with a woman, but that's not the first time that's, that's happened to me. And it's something that I'm seeing every day. Like right now. Because if somebody doesn't respond to my affection the way I think they should, it's really difficult for me not to take that personally. But that also puts up a wall between me and the people in my life that I greatly want to let in. 
it puts up a wall, like a big, beautiful wall with a big, beautiful door. Huge. And by big and beautiful, I mean just kind of bland and ugly. That's what less that was a literary device called irony, boys and girls. Because so often when I like when I try to be funny, I think that's like the only way that people can like me, right? It's, it's like when I'm making them laugh, when I'm making them and when I'm making them laugh. But I got present to something that just really, just really touched me the other day. And Emily, I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to share a little bit from our conversation. This is the conversation that I had with Emily the other day. And she said something to me that just really landed. How I have always been able to see her so completely. And that just really touched me. Because I like I've really been working on like I've really been working on being um, like being seeable myself. Being, being seen myself. And, um, it's really kind of scary because I, like, I still see that I'm, that like if I really cross certain lines with people that I'm going to get found out as fraud but when I drop that wall and let people see the real Ryan that's when That's when those magical relationships, that's when those magical connections can happen. When you're able to be real and authentic and vulnerable with the people in your life. And this is something that really scares me as a man. And I'm not the only one. I mean, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of people in the news lately who have really let that wall of protection really ruin their lives. Kevin Spacey, I'm looking at you. Now, Kevin Spacey was one of my favorite actors. I mean, his... You know, the Usual Suspects in Glengarry, Glen Ross are two of my favorite movies of the 90s. And he is brilliant in both. His scene with Al Pacino in Glengarry, his Will You Go to Lunch scene, is a masterclass, an absolute masterclass and how to deliver killer dialogue, how to deliver a great line. Go watch that. Go watch that movie. I'm just saying, will you go to lunch? But Kevin Spacey let the fact that he was hiding from, he thought he was hiding from the world, the fact that he was that he was gay or at least bisexual. To be honest, it was really one of the worst kept secrets out there. 
but he thought he was pulling the wool over people's eyes. And he got accused of this thing that happened, what was it, 30 years ago? Where he sexually assaulted this young kid, this 16-year-old at the time. And his career is toast. He's getting written out of the last season of House of Cards. I don't think he has been in anything since this um, or it, it or, or is it even in process of being in anything since all this stuff came out. And it just really breaks my heart because I think that if he was that he if, if he had just let the world inside the man, Kevin Spacey, not the characters that he plays, not the Lester Burnham, not the Kaiser Soze, not the you know, big secret, yes, he is Kaiser Soze, but not the Lester Burnham, the Kaiser Soze, the, the office manager in Glengarry, in Glengarry Glen Ross. Just letting the world see inside the man if he had done that, I think he'd still have a career. But he was so worried about looking good and not looking bad that his career is toast. And you can say the same thing about Harvey Weinstein, about Matt Lauer, about Mario Batali, um, any number of people, Roy Moore. I mean, come on. But you could say the same thing about a lot of these people because they just don't want to take responsibility for how they're showing up. They want to keep the wool pulled over people's eyes. So if I could just leave y'all with a lesson, take that chance. Let the world inside let the world inside your truth. Tell that person how you feel. Take the, you know, take the promotion. Take that chance. Take that chance on your life. And I can pretty much guarantee you that it's going to come back and it's going to reward you. It may hurt in the short term, but tell the world, tell your world your truth and it's going to get returned in kind so just really the that that's really the lesson that I want to leave y'all with is just get real get authentic drop the wall and let the people see the real you because the real you I don't care who you are the real you is beautiful the real you is magical. Let the world inside. Let the world inside and it's going to be beautiful. Now, I did want to make an announcement before we wrap things up here. If you bet the house can be... First of all, is that... As I mentioned at the um, top of this broadcast, we've been on hiatus, but Magic Time is not going anywhere. It's probably going to be after the new year before we're able to get together for new episodes, but Magic Time is not going anywhere. In fact, I may even do another solo episode, but Magic Time is not going anywhere. But I do have an announcement of something that I'm taking on myself. See, I, I just kind of alluded to it, but I have a theory. I have a theory that the world would work a lot better, or the world could actually start working again, if more men stepped up to be kings. If more men took responsibility 
for their for how they're being in their relationships for how they're showing up in their careers in their families in their in their um in their lives if more men stepped up and become kings we would have fewer stories like Matt Lauer, like Russell Simmons, like uh, like this big mess going on between Peter Jackson, who is, from what I understand, is not involved in this, or, or, or was not a party to this. He was just sort of, I guess, manipulated into it, from, from what I understand. But a big mess going on between Peter Jackson, who... The, uh, the filmmaker who made the Lord of the Rings movies and The Hobbit. But Peter Jackson, Harvey Weinstein, Mira Sorvino, and Ashley Judd. Like, there's something about a black ball. It, I, I don't really understand it, but it just sounds like it's a mess. But there would be fewer stories like that. And there would be more stories like like J.J. Watt, the often injured, but when healthy, one of the best defensive players in the entire of the NFL, raised, God, millions for hurricane relief in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Texas. There would be more kings in this world. There would be more people who could truly be respected and admired and revered. With that said, my announcement is this. Magic Time is getting a spinoff. I am beginning my own podcast beginning Friday, January the 5th. Friday, January the 5th is the very first episode of the Be A King podcast. Now, in the Be A King podcast, I'm going to... We're going to have a conversation about what it really means to be a king in this world. We're going to expose peasants. We're going to really shine the light on the true kings in this world. And really just show the world just how important, crucial, and just how beautiful the world can be. Once more men start to become kings. So beginning soon, once this episode goes up, I will include a link to where you can subscribe to the Be A King podcast. That's going to be heard on both Google Play and iTunes. Same as Magic Time. And I'm really excited about this. I'm really excited about this. I've been wanting to do something a little more intense, I guess. Like, like a little bit more involved. And I think this is the perfect avenue for me. Hell, Emily might even be a guest on it. I don't know. But I'm just truly excited to to really do my part in helping more men and supporting more men to become kings in this world. Because that is the only way that is the only way for the world to start working again is for more men to become kings. That's starting Friday, January the 5th, the Be A King podcast. Check iTunes and Google Play is going to be same kind of situation as Magic Time is going to be under the self-help category. But I will also be sharing plenty of links in my social media. A lot of people are going to be helping me get out the word on this because I'm really excited about this. So that's the Be A King podcast. First episode going up Friday, January the 5th. If you have any questions or suggestions, shoot me an email. That's teamryancoaching 
at gmail.com. I'm going to put a link to that in the description. Also, you can hit me up on Twitter. That's twitter.com slash Ryan Hall writes. Or you can just hit up the Magic Time meme at uh, 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 Twitter. That's twitter.com slash Magic Time Pod. So those three ways you can get up with us and find out more about the launch date of the Be A King podcast. So that wraps up today's party here. And um, just want to give a couple quick acknowledgments. First off, as we mentioned at the beginning of the program, Emily is not here today. But I just wanted to give her a quick... Uh, a quick acknowledgement. She gave me some news the other day that I'm like I'm still buzzing about. It is so in her wheelhouse. It is so in her like in her strong suit that I think this is gonna make her a huge just a huge deal. She's already a huge deal for me, but I don't want to be asking her for an autograph or anything. But if you knew where she was at the beginning of our relationship up until now, you would be knocked out by her power. You would absolutely be knocked out by her power. And I'll, I'll, I'll totally out her. When she shared this news with me, she was so nervous. But there was such a strength and resiliency and just really a power in the way she was showing up then, I was shaking all over. I mean, this woman has come so far, and it is truly a privilege to to call her a friend and a partner. It is truly a privilege, and you guys are going to know very soon just how big she's going to become. Love you, Em. Miss you. Come back soon. And... Before we go, I, um, I've been thinking for months about how I wanted to acknowledge this person. So I'm just gonna, just gonna speak for the heart a little bit. I think it was 2003. That was a far different guy back in, uh, back in 2003. I was uh, I was out of work. I was living with my mom and dad, and really about as depressed as I've ever been in my life. And this was right around the time this was coming off the heels of mom losing our uncle Ed, who was mom's best friend. This was to a sudden uh, heart ailment. And it really affected both mom and dad very deeply. It affected me too, and and my sister, to be honest. But it really affected mom and dad pretty, pretty hardcore. And they got pretty deep into their addictions, and especially mom. I mean, her depression and her drinking was just really, really kind of hard to be with. And it was really throwing me into a mess. At a low point, I, I wandered into this Yahoo chat room. And uh, this was a Yahoo chat room for adult children of alcoholics. And I didn't get a ton out of it at first. But there was always this one person that kept responding. I don't know if he was an administrator, or I, I can't remember, rather, if he was an administrator or just a regular poster. I think she was an admin, but I'm not positive. But her screen name was Reem, R-E-E-N. Now that... It really got me for a couple of reasons. First of all, is that Reem was one of my high school nicknames one of the nicer ones and that was really thanks to uh, to a math teacher that I had in the 10th grade named Mr. Gray who had a 
a speech impediment of some kind. I don't know if it was a cleft palate or just an awful lisp. Can't remember. But he could not say Ryan to save his life. He couldn't even give it the Southern as Ryan. It came out like Ryan. And that morphed into Reen, which was one of the few things that I kept up with. But I found out that her nickname was, well, that her um, screen name was short for Noreen. Now, I remember she had replied to something that I had written on this message board that really touched me. So I chose to reach out to her by email. Little did I know that that would be the beginning of the greatest friendship I've ever had. We never spoke. We never met in person. Our entire relationship was conducted online. But she really, Noreen, Noreen Jett was her name. And she really took on two very important roles in my life. She, uh, she, she was, she was a little older than I am. So she kind of took over the role of like that, of like that, like world weary, but street wise older sister but in many ways she became like a second mom and, and you know, I've been thinking that you know just how she just how deeply she affected me she uh like I've always had a fascination with with Native American spirituality. And she showed me more about that than anybody. She was a like her father was a chief in a Shawnee tribe. And I was even ceremonially uh, cer ceremonially? It wasn't ceremoniously, but ceremonially I, I guess I'm not really sure what the right word is here but adopted into her tribe but there are really two main ways that her relationship really changed who I am really helped to shape me and mold me and guide me she really helped me to find my voice as a writer. The beginning of our relationship was really when I was falling back in love with writing. And she really, she, she was a writer herself, primarily like academic stuff, but she was a writer herself and she, nur like she nurtured and nourished really that side of me. And she gets a shout out and written in the stone because of that but even more than that even more than Ryan the writer she really helped me to find my voice as a man just to know that to be masculine to be a man doesn't necessarily mean being macho it can be you can be a teddy bear you can be whatever you want but as long as it's coming from a real and authentic and honest place this is the kind of tie it in with our theme of this episode here just as long as it's coming from that real and authentic place then it really doesn't matter how you show up because that's what people respond to. They don't respond to fake, they respond to real. 
And let me tell you, Noreen Gent was one of the most, if not the realest person I've ever known in my life. I say all this because um, I found out that a year ago, July, she passed away. From what I understand, it was a sudden heart attack. And just judging by what she was going through, which I'm not going to put on loudspeaker, but judging by what she was going through when we were last speaking, it doesn't really surprise me. But in the uh, like in the aftermath of my finding out that she had passed away, I went through my old emails. And I found the last one that she ever sent to me. I think I'd emailed her one of my first Good Men Project columns. It was a year ago, June, that I know. But I think it was one of my first weekly Good Men Project articles. And her one sentence response was, I couldn't be more proud of you if you were my own son. She was a treasure, and I will be forever grateful. Thank you. On that incredibly uplifting note, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this episode here. Ooh, ooh, I was trying really hard not to cry through this, but I couldn't help it. Thank you so much for listening to Magic Time and joint production of Team Ryan Productions and Love Living Holistics. For more information, just get online and hit up our Twitter. That's twitter.com slash magictimepod. Or email us at magictimepodcast at gmail.com. For Emily Perkins, I'm Ryan Hall saying thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Red. And so long for now. Thank you for listening to Magic Time, a joint production of Team Ryan Productions and Love Living Holistics. Subscribe on iTunes. Follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash magictimepod. And connect with Ryan and Emily by email at magictimepodcast at gmail.com.